Robert Pattinson. Well done. <laughs> How did, how did the conversation begin? Uh, I, <clears throat> I, um, I, was, I, I, got, I got an offer for, for the movie out of nowhere, and I was like three weeks, there's three weeks left of shooting the last Twilight movie. That was that movie about vampires, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I read it, and I kind of loved it, and then... Uh, uh, then I suddenly realized afterwards what the implication of getting an offer for a movie was, where you actually had to do it afterwards. And uh, it, it terrified me. And I couldn't even, you know, because actors, you spend pretty much your entire career bullshitting directors or bullshitting everybody right. to make out that you know what you're talking about and you know right. what you're doing when you <coughs> know nothing. <laughs> and uh, uh, I knew David had done the script and I knew about his work and kind of how he was as a person, I knew I couldn't really bullshit him. So uh, I was terrified of even making the phone call saying yes or no. So I basically called him up and said, I don't know what it's about, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know why you offered it to me. <laughs> but, I mean, it was just like, Way to sell. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. And I bet your said, agent loved that. Well, <laughs> <No. Yeah. laughs> shooting it, but I mean, you're trapped in that seat. Yeah, but I mean, eventually you kind of, the other thing, I think James Gandolfini was saying like, uh, if he would try and make everything, every scene, try and figure out a way to sit down in it. Like it's, it's a really good tip as an actor. Everything becomes easier uh, as soon as you sit down in a seat. Like, you know, you should figure out every single bit of blocking just, just to have a seat in it. And if not a seat, a bed is even better. <laughs> but, and, uh, <laughs> like, uh, Rob, you read the script and you said yes. Did you read the book? Um, I hadn't read it before. I hadn't read any DeLillo before right. I read the script. So the dialogue and everything, the style seemed kind of completely fresh, like almost to the point it was jarring, um, especially when I was reading a lot of scripts at the time and suddenly something comes with this. It's, not, it's, it's very kind of poetic and musical and no one really... There's not a lot of screenwriting that really concentrates on dialogue. It's not the most important thing. It's kind of, it's what one of your jobs is as an actor is, you know, to make it sound like real words, not right. just. Um, and to have something that's so highly stylized, but also very engaging, it didn't seem like it was stylized without, point, without a point, um, which I think is really difficult. Everyone uses that clip as the comedy clip. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Why, <laughs> Rob? I think I screwed little... up the order. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you did. A nice guest might not have pointed that out. <laughs> Thanks, I could have bro. told you. Ro Rob is not nice. <laughs> it was weird. Okay. I did a Good Morning America this morning, and the, the whole crew was hysterically laughing at that clip. I was just like. What? I mean, uncontrollable laughter. <laughs> totally out of context. I was like, wow, Good Morning America is, is the target audience. for the, 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 <laughs> You got you to gotta get them before they've had too much coffee. <laughs> did, did you, Rob, did you see your character as evil? Not at all. No. Callow? Yeah, a little, a little self-obsessed. I mean, that's kind of, but I mean... Not evil at all. I mean, I've read things with people saying he's like a monster, and it's like, no, it's kind of... I, I, I always saw it as relatively hopeful when I was playing it. I mean, he's, he's reaching for something. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's not, he's, he's not trying to hurt other people, even though he sort of, you know, theoretically is. Like, he has no... With intention. the flick of a wrist, he's hurting a lot of people. Yeah, but it's like, but it's, it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's fictions. You know, he, he he's... he's uh, his relationship with empathy is very, you know, it's, it's like it's kind of, he doesn't really understand it very much. Yeah, when he was in the Montessori line where they handed out empathy, <laughs> I don't think, I think they had run out. But the whole story, I think a lot of it, I mean, well, one of my part, one of my ideas about it was, you know, that's what he's trying to find. I mean, and he kind of gets it for a second at the end when he tells Paul Giamatti, um, when he tells Benno, 
uh, I could tell you the my my life's changed in the course of a day, and it has. Like he's, and so he has that few seconds of, of being himself, and um, and he suddenly and, he, and that that's that's who he is. I think. I met you four years ago at the King of Prussia Mall in <laughs> Pennsylvania. The, at the hot tub. <laughs> Before Edward was you, and, <laughs> and the don't confuse them. Don't confuse <laughs> them. Just say I'm not the. <laughs> so at that time, you were you know an unknown British actor who played a little music and. Um, all these people were assigning, you know, great hopes to you that came true, I would say. I don't know if people were even assigning great hopes to me. I think I was literally just trying to sell t-shirts in the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, okay. really, trying, to but, make, trying to make a, a buck any way I could. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but I just, I want to get to this issue of money. At, at the time, you probably I, uh, didn't... Uh, you probably didn't have much, and you probably have now made a couple of bucks here and there, right? <laughs> Do you, other than buying, I bet you, a couple of guitars, <laughs> does, is your relationship, have you learned anything about money? Did, it bring, did you bring any of that to the role? Because, I mean, you didn't grow up uh, poor, but being an actor, if you do it right, has significant compensations. Did, so did anything you learned about money come into play on this film? Um, I don't know. I mean, because I, 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 I really don't want to say it, but I think it's probably the case. I probably have a very similar relationship with, with the money. I mean, like, however small or large the amount, it still seems relatively fictional. I mean, I have the same relationship with money, I guess, as I do with, like, success or failure. Like, it's just an imposter. I mean, it's just kind of, it's, it's a, it is a fiction. I mean... Well, you, in a way, you're, you're like your character. You don't really see it. Someone tells you you probably have some money. Yeah, I'd say you're broke now. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he spends all his money on clothes, as you can see. They're newlyweds. They should be doing it like bunnies. The movie is set over the course of one day as well. <laughs> like, That's right. So maybe. And he does have sex with two other women. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> yeah, it's hard to feel bad. For your <laughs> but I also wondered what uh, um, what was happening in that world that Mr. DeLillo and you, you made in terms of um, <clears throat> were we seeing a momentary sort of spasm, or thing, were things fundamentally changing? Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in the world of it, um, it's weird because I mean I, I've always just thought it was just it's it's a character study. I mean that's think that's why I think I, I don't know if this is why you were going there, but I mean some of the scenes weren't even in the car when when I even when I signed it. There was about there was about eighty percent of the scenes in, in the limousine when I first signed on, and we, Dave was putting more and more and more of them in there, and I think it is because like. I think he bears no real relationship, his story with, with the financial market. I, I didn't do a single shred of research. I didn't study any traders. It was nothing. I was looking at sociopaths. I mean, like that's sociopaths and uh, Howard Dean. <laughs> Which right. I, haven't, I mean, and just kind of random, like almost random elements of things yeah. and, and, and stuff about music. I mean, that was kind of, um, I was listening to like, like John Cage and things. I mean, it's like just trying to, I don't know, sort of find someone who he, it's, it's more about rebirth than the world. I mean, he doesn't want to be part of the world. I think the world is exactly the same. Like there's, right. he's living totally independently to it. Yeah. And is desperate, desperate to live independent to it. Um, that's why I kind of, that's why, one of the reasons why I thought it was quite hopeful. Cause like he, he does in a funny sort of way want to change the world. And, uh, well, he certainly is in trying to self-actualize in a way. Yeah, like it's, it's a the dream. Moment. The 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 uh, the riots a dream. I mean, it's kind of it even even doing it as one of the main things because all, all the Occupy stuff was going on at the time, and uh, 
sitting in, I mean, just being on a set and having 200 extras rocking, like really rocking the, the limousine around. And we're, we're doing a scene. I mean, you do one take and it's kind of frightening. And then afterwards you just really, you, know, you do the fourth, fifth take and you don't even notice it. Like you're just like, you're playing the scene. I was amused by it. I mean, a woman comes up with, with the big old rat at the yeah. window and he, he just kind of she smiles. She just had a funny he face. <laughs> <laughs> I just liked her face. That was just a, that was, that was an instinctive reaction. <laughs> that was actually the one scene that's not part of my performance. That wasn't, that, that wasn't contrived at all. <laughs> I thought you were looking at her sort of glowy. <laughs> wow, there's, there's traders, there's bankers who are skating around regulation. There's, what if the media paid as much attention to that as they do to my romantic life. I was literally saying that this morning. That's really strange. I yeah. said the exact same thing. I mean, it's Did like... you, were you monitoring? <laughs> do you have like some little drones that yeah. hover? That's gonna be about your next movie, my whole technique about using, <laughs> using technology to track. <laughs> yeah. um, because but, yeah, Rob was just saying that. Exactly no, I mean, that. The, the, it kind of, for, uh, yeah, I mean, the, there's like, there's this weird thing about accountability, like where, uh, you know, you think, you know, stuff like paparazzi or whatever. Um, I don't think that, you know, I'm like a private citizen. I don't make any laws or anything. And yet I have less, you know, I don't have the, if, if, if a bunch of people followed you around, you call the cops, you get them arrested. It's, uh, you know, it's whatever. Like, but, uh, but, but like, but it, kind of, and it impinges on your, on your reality on a day-to-day -day 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 basis, and it's kind of, there's this weird relationship with fame uh, in America where it's kind of valued, I think, disproportionately highly. And, um, but, uh, and so you know, it's something to do with, like, this is a kind of American dream aspect to it. I mean, it's, like, it's an attainable thing for everyone. But, um, you know, with politicians and things, you know, I think the, the, they really should. It would actually make people behave a lot better, like with politicians and bankers, if they actually had, if uh, people were interested in reading about them. But no one's interested because it's it's probably too miserable, to be honest. Like, right. Uh, but you'd like to send the posse that follows you after them. Well, I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't. I, w I wouldn't want to be the one responsible for asking the go because I'd probably get thrown out of the country. But like, <laughs> like, uh, I mean. You know, things are, you know, things fall apart when they're supposed to fall apart. Like, it's kind of, there's a, I don't think, you know, the, America's a very hopeful country. And, uh, you know, the, it's funny coming from England where the whole main cultural attitude is like being the underdog all the time. I right. don't think, and, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's strange to live in the, to, and kind of fascinating and amazing to live in a place where, you know, like the idea of freedom, for instance, like is kind of held up at its only country, I think, which is values the word so highly. I, you sound, I don't even know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I, you, like, I was trying to go somewhere with it, and then <laughs> it's too late. But uh, uh, yeah, what was even the question? What am I talking about? Uh, it's terrible. I've actually listened to you talk I, about I, high goal. I, I, I actually remember what Rob said when he was articulate and knew. <laughs> well, I could repeat that. But the other so, thing, <laughs> the, the thing about high goal as well, I just want to say, but just to, re to redeem myself, that I didn't realize in an, uh, uh, there's a Calvin and, you know Calvin and Hobbes? Uh, there's a, it's one of them. There's, a, there's one of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes cartoon strips called Sci Scientific Progress Goes Boink. Uh, has this whole thing about Heigl. I had no idea it was about Heigl. It's like Calvin is having this conversation with his dad, saying that the whole of the human... The, yeah. Yeah, the, whole, the whole of human history was to create... But uh, anyway. You know, I think now hearing Rob, I think I have to reshoot the movie. <laughs> Another actor. I only uh, read books with pictures. <laughs> 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 <laughs>